This video is supported by Skillshare. Goats have weird eyes. Their pupils are weird and horizontal and rectangular. It's like, it's like, it's like they're human eyes, but not. There's something really disconcerting about them. I think that's why they're often portrayed as uh, pagan or satanic symbols. I mean, cats have got weird pupils. They have vertical slits, but we all seem kind of fine with that. There's something about the horizontalness of the goat eyes that are just, ugh. Like, don't get me wrong, baby goats might be the cutest thing on the face of the earth, especially Damascus baby goats. Have you ever seen a Damascus baby goat? Look at this thing. It's, its ears go all the way to the ground and they curl in little ringlets like a baby's hair and their mouths just sort of naturally form into smiles and they got these big weird goat eyelashes around their big weird goat eyes. I mean, this looks like some kind of Disney character. I'm growing ovaries just looking at it. Now, I mean, of course, you know, the cuteness does fade a little bit as it gets older like all of us do, you know, but I'm sure the adult versions, you know, they might not be quite as cute, but I'm sure they're handsome fellows and ladies, you know, when you're starting from the- God, God, what the <laughs> son of a bitch. Oh my <laughs> How is that the same goat? Ah. Uh. Wah. Ah. Uh. Well, now that Disney owns Star Wars, I guess that is a Disney character. Oh yeah, uh, the eyes. Those horizontal goat pupils give them insane peripheral vision from 320 to 340 degrees of sight. They can see almost perfectly in almost all directions. For comparison, we only have 180 degrees of peripheral vision because our eyes are centered, you know, forward like this, like most predators. This gives us excellent depth perception, so when we see some prey, we can pounce on it. But goats, like most ungulates, have eyes on the side of their head so they can see predators coming from all directions and those horizontal pupils give them almost perfect clarity so that everything's in focus all the way around. Of course, that comes at the price of their binocular vision. They only get about 20 degrees of that ahead of them, but luckily for them, what they eat, grass, doesn't exactly run away from them. So goat's eyes allow them to take a constant survey of the area around them so they can see any changes in their environment. It's a good survival strategy. And that's also the strategy of TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, constantly scanning the universe for signs of habitable planets. And that is how an eyeball can lead to a much bigger un- God! <laughs> the first exoplanet was discovered in 1995 by Swiss astronomers Malcolm Mayor and Didier Kalos, who I owe a deep, deep apology to because there's no way I pronounced that right. Also, how crazy is that? I mean, 1995 was just... Well, I guess it was 20, what, 25, yeah, no. 25 years ago? 1995 was 25 years ago. Excuse me. It went by the name 51 Pegasi B and it was discovered by a process known as Doppler spectroscopy. Basically, they observed a wobble in the star 51 Pegasi, and after mathing the s*** out of it, they were able to ascertain that it was probably caused by a large planet-like body. Since then, hundreds of planets have been discovered using the Doppler technique, but far more have been discovered using something called transit photometry. When a planet passes in front of its star, the star briefly appears to dim. By measuring the change of intensity of light from a given star over time, astronomers can deduce the presence of one or more planets orbiting that star. Several Earth-based telescopes use transit photometry, including the UK's Wide Angle Search for Planets, or WASP, which has been the most successful, with more than 150 exoplanets discovered so far. France's Corot telescope was the first to discover an exoplanet from space, and also the first to observe a rocky Earth-like exoplanet. But the undisputed king of exoplanet discovery is NASA's Kepler Space Telescope. In fact, more than half of all exoplanets we've found have been found by Kepler. Kepler was a freaking beast. It survived several different critical system failures and just kept on going and was eventually finally retired in October of 2018, although scientists are still crunching the data from Kepler and making discoveries to this day. So how do you top that? With a giant goat eye in the sky. TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, was launched in April of 2018 with the goal of observing large sectors of the night sky at a time, rather than just targeting one particular area. That's the survey part of its name. Astronomers think TESS could find as many as 20,000 exoplanets. At the time of this video, close to 1,600 exoplanet candidates have been found by TESS, with 37 of them confirmed. There are less than six months left in TESS's initial two-year mission, but the satellite is in such good shape, NASA's decided to extend it through 2022. Now, one thing that's interesting about TESS is it's not really designed to confirm exoplanets. It's designed to find exoplanet candidates that are then later confirmed by other satellites. One of those is actually the James Webb Space Telescope. 
Tessa is going to find a whole bunch of planet candidates, and then James Webb will go and focus on them when it goes up in 2021, God willing. In fact, Tess is spending extra time looking at parts of the sky that the JWST can look at year round so they can actually uh, have more opportunity to find planets in those areas. So if you can imagine all the stars printed on the inside of a celestial globe with us in the middle, uh, Tess is actually focusing on the north and the south poles of that globe. Tess spent his first 351 days focused around the south pole in the constellation Dorado. Right now it's spending another 351 days observing the north pole in the Draco constellation. Surveying nearly the entire sky is a hugely ambitious project, and by the end of its initial mission, it will observe over a half a million stars. And each of these observations are made in full frame photographs and downloads every 30 minutes. So will Tess be able to find all the exoplanets out there? Uh, no, not even, not even close. Transit photometry is great and it's been super successful, but it can only find planets that are lined up along the plane of the orbit with their stars. I, thought, I need a way to show this. If only I had like a Tron disc. Yeah, so imagine this is a star, and this is the orbit of the planets going around the star, and you are looking from Earth, so uh, imagine you're on Earth. So in order for this technique to work, the plane of the planets has to line up exactly with you. If it's off by even just a few degrees, we would miss it completely. There's like 179 degrees that we would miss. So there's only a very small percentage of planets that we could actually see with this method, which makes the fact that we've caught so many of them this way even more impressive. I mean, that just gives you a small idea of just how many exoplanets there are out there. Back to the shelf with you. That Tron disc, by the way, is symbolic of one of the most ardent supporters I've had on Patreon for the longest time, Matt Herring, so thanks, Matt. So to notice the transit, Tess has to benchmark a star's brightness and then watch it for a period of time, usually about 27 days, and then it moves on to the next sector. There's 26 of them total. Now compare this to the Hubble Deep Field, which focused on a tiny little patch of the sky for a very, very long period of time and allowing, you know, photons from many billions of years ago to come in and see these galaxies that were really far away. Hubble, by the way, can take exposures for up to 22 days, but in total it takes more than 50 days to do that because it rotates around the Earth 15 times every single day, so it can only do a certain number of hours per passage. Now Tess gets around this by operating at a much higher orbit. It takes 13.7 days for it to orbit the Earth. Now, orbital periods also limit the number of planets that we might find with Tess because it can only watch a patch of sky for 27 days. Now, Mercury, by contrast, takes 88 days to orbit the Sun. And that's the shortest orbital period in our system, so if Tess were watching us from a distant star, chances are they probably wouldn't have no idea we were here. But that's probably not a huge handicap for Tess. There are still plenty of star-hugging planets out there. In fact, the average orbital period for the planets that it's found is 13 days. In fact, Tess and other exoplanet surveys have given plenty of reason to think that we might actually be the outlier in our universe. It kind of gives more oomph to the rare earth hypothesis theory. Now, another thing about Tess is that it's actually fairly expensive. It's about half the cost of Kepler, and most of that came from the U.S. government, but 2.5 million of it came from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. MIT scientists have been heavily involved with Tess from the beginning. In fact, the Tess science team includes three MIT astronomers and one from Harvard. And the resumes from this team are, uh, what's the word? Impressive. Take, for example, Deputy Science Director Sarah Seeger, PhD. She worked on TESS, OSIRIS-REx, the Spitzer Space Telescope, Kepler, and the James Webb Space Telescope. And somewhere in there, she may have slept, but I can't be sure. Professor Seeger was actually kind enough to answer some of our questions over email about the TESS project, and when we asked her why there's only been 37 exoplanets confirmed so far, she had this to say. In the short term, we were only searching relatively bright stars for planet candidates. She goes on to say, it takes time to go through all the data. It's fair to say the TESS community has not searched through all the data, particularly the fainter stars. Recall there are far more fainter stars than bright ones. Now, when it comes to the estimates of how many planets we might find with TESS, some of those initial estimates were based on simulations that were run before the final mission parameters were set in stone. And they could redo those, but that would require running new simulations, and according to the professor, quote, It's too early to embrace a more conservative estimate. We're too busy finding planets to do that for the time being. Well played. So what kind of discoveries has TESS made? Well, it actually started making discoveries before it officially began its mission. On July 25th, 2018, it recorded a video of comet C-2018-N1 orbiting the Sun 29 million miles from Earth, and that was when it was just testing its cameras. Following that, it discovered a rocky super-Earth, LHS 3844b, which once upon a time so-called terrestrial worlds were thought to be less common in the Milky Way than we think they are now. TESS is adding to that catalog while also locating several gas giants on the scale of Jupiter and Neptune. 
In fact, I've found three potentially rocky exoplanets all huddled up close to star L9859, but all three were too close to be in the star's habitable zone. Exoplanet GJ357D is a potentially habitable world discovered by ground-based telescopes after tests called attention to it. That same system also had two fast hot worlds, so a potentially habitable one was a bonus. One of the really cool things we caught with TESS was a supermassive black hole devouring a star about the size of our sun in the Volans constellation in January of 2019. This specific type of star shredding is called a tidal disruption event, something like this is thought to occur in the Milky Way only once every 10 to 100,000 years. TESS even caught the transit of a star around another star. It was in the star system Alpha Draconis, and it looks just like one star from optical telescopes. In fact, it went by the name Thuban. But after watching Thuban peak and dim in brightness, TESS was able to observe two eclipses, one star transiting the other, over a period of 38 and a half days. And actually, there was some huge news, like just last week, that NASA announced that TESS found uh, the first Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of its star. It's a planet called TOI 700D, and it orbits around a red dwarf in the habitable zone. Now, because red dwarfs are smaller, the planets that orbit them tend to orbit very close, and this tends to tidally lock them, creating what they call eyeball planets. It's not the best case scenario for life, but scientists do believe that this one could have water on its surface, so it's a really important one. So while TESS is expected to continue its mission through 2022, there are some new telescopes that are coming out to keep an eye on. The European Space Agency just lost CHEOPS, an exoplanet hunter specifically designed to follow up results from TESS and others. Like I said before, one of the big things about the James Webb Space Telescope is to follow up on some of TESS's results, so TESS is going to keep people occupied for quite some time. Not to mention several ground-based telescopes that are on their way, which I mentioned in a previous video. The bottom line is the scientific community is going to be reaping the benefits of TESS for a long time to come, and it's going to go a long way towards shaping our understanding of exoplanets. Before 1995, People scoffed at the idea of there actually being other planets out there. I mean, it was great for science fiction, you know, scenarios, but nobody thought they were real. Today we found over 4,000 planets, and a dizzying array of them, from hot Jupiters that are so hot that they shouldn't even really exist, to, to eyeball super-Earths, to some planets we literally can't even wrap our heads around. And now we believe the actual number of planets in just our galaxy could be in the trillions. With numbers like that, most scientists believe it's just a matter of time before we find that one world that has just the right conditions for life, just like our own. And maybe in 25 years we'll look back fondly at the time when we scoffed at the idea that there might actually be extraterrestrials out there. I mean, for all we know, the aliens could be on Earth right now. It's looking at me, isn't it? Hey, you know, one of the coolest things about astronomy right now is not only the role of citizen scientists in culling through all the data that NASA is discovering, but also in, you know, creating images of their own. So maybe you want to do that, or maybe you just like taking cool pictures of the night sky. Either way, you might want to check out the class Nightscapes Landscape Astrophotography on Skillshare. Taught by photographer Ian Norman, this class will help you find the right locations for shooting dark skies, the right techniques to capture the images you're after, and the equipment to help you make images that will blow your mind. And more important, everybody else's mind. This is of course just one of hundreds of courses you can take on Skillshare, covering all kinds of subjects like photography, but also photo editing, film and video production, graphic design, music, as well as productivity courses and business classes. It's 2020, the start of a new year, which is the perfect time to explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. And you can kickstart that with Skillshare's online classes, which are super affordable at only $10 a month, but if you sign up at my link below, you'll get two free months of Skillshare Premium, and then within minutes, you'll be exploring your creativity like never before. Millions of people are learning on Skillshare right now, so don't get left behind. You can get two months for free when you go to the link in the description down below. Big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping to support this channel, build a community. Uh, I have a team because of the people that support on Patreon. I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, there are some new people that have joined. Let me murder their names real quick. We've got RPR, uh, Michael Parks, Damon Layton, Karen Elizabeth Smith, Tony Bazile, uh, Adam Chidley, Simon Gould, Adam Vinson, Kaylee Blixt Hagholm, <laughs> uh, Peter Pranu, Garrett Holmes, Rick B, Mark Richmond, Scott Holloway, Holiday, uh, Johan Korn, Jamie Hernandez, and Scott Edwards. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos and just more access to me and join this awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Cool t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. It's not just t-shirts, it's posters, it's hoodies, it's mugs, all the fun stuff that you could want. If you want people to look at your shirt and go, ha, I get that, then you know that they're cool. So you can go there, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. It does support this channel and it supports a great designer in Prague. 
Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check this one out. Google thinks you'll like that one because Google's watching you. And or you might check out all these over here on the side that might have my face on it. And if you like them and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.